Scene five of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs by Jesse Bram White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene five in the house of the seven dwarfs. The room is the same as before, but quite transformed by Snow White's housekeeping. It shines with cleanness. There are white coverlets on all the beds, curtains at the window, and flowers on the window sill. Snow White's silver dress has been carefully put away, and she wears a little frock made of squirrel skins and trimmed with bright leaves. It is early in the morning, and the dwarfs are just starting off for the day's work. Each carries a neat little basket of luncheon, which Snow White has put up, and each wears a bright bow-tie which she has made for him. They are so proud of these ties that they have parted their beards over their shoulders to show them. Snow White has just finished tying Queenie's bow. She pats it into shape, kisses him, and says, There! Off you go! Couldn't you please give us all another kiss? No, indeed. Just one? Not one. A little one? No. That's the rule. One a day, morning and night, but not both. You see, none of us ever, uh, should I say ate or tasted a kiss till you came, so perhaps we are a little eager about them. I should say you were. Why, you perfect children about kisses and games. That comes of our being dwarfs. You see, no dwarf is ever born till he's fifty. So, as we've never been young, we enjoy games all the more now. Oh, I understand, you little old dears. But I still mustn't spoil you. And that reminds me, you're not to come home any more in the middle of the morning to play games. Tuesday you came back at eleven, Wednesday at ten, and yesterday morning at nine. What sort of way to work is that? I know, but— Now, not a moment before five today, because— This is a secret. I'm going to make an enormous cake with sugar frosting for supper. Now off with you. Well, brothers, ready. Today we go into the forest for firewood. March. In their usual military file, the dwarfs march off into the forest. Snow White stands in the doorway, waving her hand after them till they are out of sight. Then, with a little sigh of content, she returns to the room. Oh, I'm so happy here. I've never been so happy in all my life. Of course I miss their maids of honour and the others, but the dwarfs are so funny and loving and kind. She looks out of the window. It's a beautiful day. <sighs> I wonder if I shall ever see Prince Florimond again. Stop that, Snow White. You wander about him much too often. Remember, you're not a princess any more, only just a housekeeper to the seven dwarfs. You must forget all about the other things. To work. Now for that cake. She fetches the mixing bowl. As she does so, the little brown bird that guided her through the forest flies to the window, perches on the sill, and gives his call. Ah, my little brown bird, back again for your morning crumbs. Here they are. She scatters the crumbs, but instead of eating them, the little bird breaks into full song. Not hungry? Just come to sing for me. You dare. The song is so merry that she dances a step or two. Whenever you sing, Brown Bird, I feel like dancing. But I do need somebody to dance with. The dwarfs never can learn. Just then she spies a big white butterfly that is fluttering gaily by the window. Oh, there's a big white butterfly. I wonder if it would come and dance with me. She runs to the open door and calls. White butterfly, white butterfly, will you come and dance with Snow White? Oh, it's coming, it's coming. Sing, little brown bird. The butterfly is coming to dance with me. And indeed, the butterfly does follow her into the room, and flits about here and there, now just within her grasp, now high over her head. And Snow White, now pursuing it, now letting it follow her, does contrive a little romping dance with her new friend. And all the time the little brown bird sings lustily on the window sill. Suddenly the brown bird stops singing and flies away, and the white butterfly darts to the door and flutters up among the tree tops. 
"'Oh, don't stop, little bird. We want to go on. Where are you going, white butterfly?' "'They've both flown away. They seem frightened.' She turns to see what has frightened them. The queen, disguised as the peddler woman, is leaning in at the window. Snow White's hand springs to her heart. Oh, did I frighten you, dearie? No harm in an old peddler woman. You did startle me. So that's the way you pass your time in the forest, is it? Singing and dancing. What a thing it is to be rich. But I'm not rich. I suppose I'm very poor now. I've come a weary way. I'm that worn and footsore. Oh, do come in. I'm so sorry. Entering. Thank you, dearie. I'll just bar the door behind me for fear of the rheumatic draughts. I've been wandering days and days in this forest, and never met a soul to buy the least trinket of me. I'm afraid I don't think a deserted forest is a very good place to sell things. But you will buy some little thing, my pet, some pretty little thing. I'm awfully sorry, but— Don't any of my pretty things tempt you? And cheap really costs more to sell em than they're worth. Look, sweetheart, here's ribbons and laces and gentlemen's braces, a feather as white as foam, a chain and a locket, a purse for your pocket, and oh, what a beautiful comb! Just see what a beautiful comb! Here's bangles and spangles, a bracelet with dangles, a necklace with beads from Rome, an outfit for cross-stitch, the egg of an ostrich. But, oh, what a beautiful comb! That comb, a really magnificent comb! Here's powder and patches and lucifer matches, a motto with home sweet home, and trimmings for frockings and stockings with clockings, but nothing so fine as this comb! This comb! Just look what a beautiful comb! They're very attractive, but I've no money. Now that's too bad, dearie. I don't hardly feel as if I could go without leaving some little thing behind me. Rather make you a present, so I would. Oh, I couldn't take a present from you. I ought to be giving you something instead. You gave me kind words and bid me in friendly. I'll tell you what. If you've no money, I'll make you a free gift, sweetheart. I couldn't, really. I'm set on it, my lamb, set on it. Name your choice, and yours it shall be. Well— since you're so very kind, I'll take that spool of thread. Spool o' thread, indeed! Would you mock a poor body? Now, what do you say to this comb? That? Why, that's the finest thing you have. Just why I give it to you, my dear, and the lovely it will look a-shining in your black hair. Shrinking away. No, no, I couldn't take anything so valuable. Come, dearie, just let me put it in for you, and then if you don't like the look of it, well, I'll say no more and be on my way. I should like to see how it looks, just for fun. That's my pet, that's my sweetheart. Now sit you down. Snow White sits on a stool. And shut your eyes so you shan't peep till it's in. Are they shut? <laughs> yes, tight shut. Then here goes. She puts the poisoned comb in Snow White's hair. For a moment, Snow White does not move. Then, with a little moan, she rises, swaying. Oh, oh, my head! My head! She tries to put her hand to her head, but suddenly she totters, falls in a heap on the floor, and lies quite still. The peddler woman watches her for a moment, then cries exultingly. Aha! So, my dear stepdaughter, Queen Brangomar laughs, laughed after all. Now to count to one hundred while the poison works. One, two, three, four, five. What's that? Steps are heard outside the little house. They come nearer. There is a knock at the door, and Blick's voice is heard. Snow White, it's us, the dwarfs. Open the door. The dwarfs! They'll tear me to pieces if they find me here. I must hide her. Where? Where? She looks about for a place to hide Snow White, and seeing no other hope, 
drags the big table over her and pulls the tablecloth down to hide her. Meantime, the dwarfs knock more and more impatiently. Please open Snow White. We haven't come back for games, honestly. We want to go down into the mines again. The peddler woman crouches along the wall, looking for some means of escape. Snow White! Snow White! Snow, Snow White. White! Brothers, there's something wrong. The window. The dwarfs run to the window and look in. They spy the crouching peddler woman. Realizing that she is caught and ducking and curtsying. Oh, it's you, my little gentleman. Open the door. Yes, indeed, your honors. At once, your honors. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Quickly, I tell you. Yes, your honors. She throws the door open. The dwarfs rush in fiercely, their little knives drawn, and surround the peddler woman. What are you doing here? Where is Snow White? Safe and sound, my little gentleman. But I've scarce breath to tell you. Just give me thirty seconds, or thirty-one, or thirty-two, or thirty-three. What are you mumbling? I was passing with my basket of wares. Blick makes a threatening gesture and she hurries on with a little cry. Ah, just passing, when your sweet little lady calls me to step in. Where is she now? She stepped into the forest on an errand and bid me mind the house till she got back. Errand? What errand? How long has she been gone? A matter of seconds, your honor. Fifty seconds, maybe, or fifty-one, or fifty-two, or fifty-three, or fifty-four. Well, you need stay no longer. Go. Yes, your honors. Certainly, your honors. She goes curtsying to the door, but turns to say, Could you tell a poor peddling body how far it might be to the next town? Is it fifty-five miles now, or fifty-six, or fifty-seven, or... Be off, or we'll lay hands on you. With a little scream, the peddler woman makes off. But as she passes the window, she is heard still counting. Fifty-eight, fifty-nine, sixty, sixty-one. Till her voice dies away in the distance. Brothers, something's wrong. What errand could Snow White have in the forest? And why didn't we meet her? She'd never leave the house in her charge. Unless she was frightened. And ran away. That's it. She may be hiding in the forest now. Quick, brothers, go east, west, north, and I'll go south. All the dwarfs rush out except Blick, who hesitates. Yet it's not like Snow White to be frightened. I wonder... Suddenly he spies something on the floor near the table. It is one of Snow White's slippers that came off when she fell, and which the peddler woman had overlooked. What's that? Her slipper? Brothers! Brothers! She is here! Here is her slipper! Search the house! The dwarfs rush back into the room and begin to seek under the beds and behind the pump. But Flick pulls up the tablecloth and cries, Look, here she is. They move the table away and kneel about her in consternation. She has fainted. Water. Is she hurt? Unlace her bodice. It's loose. She's breathing faintly. What's that in her hair? A comb. She never wore it before. Out with it. He draws the comb from Snow White's hair, but suddenly hurls it away, crying. Ooh, it burned my fingers. Poisoned? Look! Snow White's eyelids flutter and she sighs. See? Her eyes! She's coming too! <sighs> oh, what... what happened? Snow, Snow White. White. White! I was talking with the old peddler woman. Ah. The old woman. And where is she? Why, there's the comb. The comb? She wanted to give it to me. I let her put it in my hair just to see how it looked, and then I must have fainted. Brothers, that comb was poisoned. She tried to poison our Snow White. To poison me? Perhaps it may have been the comb. But she didn't. You saved me, didn't you, my dear brothers? I'm all alive again, and quite well. See? She rises. Brothers. 
he draws his knife, and the others follow his example. Snick, you stay to guard Snow White. The rest follow me. They hasten toward the door. Stopping them. Where are you going? To catch that peddler woman. Oh, please don't. Why should she want to poison me? The only one who might want to harm me is Queen Brangomar. Snow White, I believe that was Queen Brangomar. Oh, no. Brangomar is very beautiful. But she knows magic. She may have disguised herself. Come, brothers. Barring the way. Oh, please, please don't go. She might harm you. Harm us? Let me go, Snow White. Clinging to him. No, no. Listen. If that was Brangomar, she'll think I'm all dead now and won't try again. But if she finds out that I'm still alive, she might. Don't you see? I see, but... Oh, I ask you, please. It's not fair to ask us, please. But I do. I ask you, please, please, please. As he sheathes his knife. Well, this time. But, brothers, we must guard our princess more carefully in the future. Yes, yes indeed. indeed. Snow White... Promise that when we're away, you will keep the door barred and never let anyone in. No matter who they are. No matter what they look like. Oh, I'm not afraid. But you must promise solemnly. Oh, very well, I promise. Truly, ruly, black and bluely, cross my heart. Now let's forget all about such disagreeable things. I'll tell you, let's declare this morning a holiday. Dancing with delight. A holiday! And we'll all play a game before you go back to the mines. Hip, hip, hurrah! hurrah! Shall we play Blind Man's Buff, or Puss in the Corner, or Snap the Whip? Blind Man's Buff, Puss, Puss in the Corner, and Snap, snap the whip. whip! All three? Well, Blind Man's Buff first. Clear away! They clear the floor for games, and begin with Blind Man's Bluff. The dwarfs always want Snow White to choose who shall be blindfolded. They never can agree among themselves. And she chooses Glick. Now, Glick is a very spry old fellow, and he nearly catches Wick on the very first dash. So nearly that Wick only escapes by crawling under a bed. Next, he corners Quee. But Quee is so small that he creeps out between Glick's legs. It is a long while before Glick can touch anybody else. And indeed, he only catches Snick at last, because Snick trips over his own long beard and falls flat. Even then it takes Glick some time to tell whom he has caught, for the dwarfs are all very much alike. But at last Glick feels a bump on Snick's bald head that came at least a hundred and twenty-five years ago, when an enormous diamond fell on him in the mines, and has never gone away again. Next they play Puss in the Corner, and get so excited about it, that they clamber all over the clean, starched coverlets that Snow White had only just finished ironing. So she is relieved when the game is over. Finally comes Snap the Whip. They snap it so hard that when the line breaks they all fall down, puffing and holding their old sides. And little Quee, the snapper, has to turn four complete somersaults before he can stop. No sooner have they got breath again then they all surround Snow White, dancing up and down and crying, More, 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 more. But she shakes her head firmly. Dear me, no. Remember, I have that cake to bake before supper. You really must go. And don't come back till five. Oh, please make it four. Or half past, anyhow. No, five. Not a moment sooner. Well, brothers, march. And down they all file into the underground passage, leaving Snow White alone. Hasn't this been a morning? I only got as far with that cake as a bowl. Now, first the flower. She puts some flour in the bowl, and then suddenly remembers. Gracious! I almost forgot my promise to bar the door. She bars the door, but as she does so, she hears in the forest a distant sort of chanting song. It comes nearer. What's that? Somebody singing? I was only just in time. Why, they're coming here. You can hear the words of the chanting clearly now. They are... Anybody want to buy any sort of baker's pie? 
pies 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 oh a baker man selling pies really people do have the most curious idea about this forest the person coming is as a matter of fact queen brangamar in another disguise she suspected that the dwarfs might take the comb from snow white's hair before the poison had time to do its work so she hastened back to the witch who wasn't a bit glad to see her and with a dose from the orange bottle transformed herself again this time into the likeness of the one-eyed pieman then she or i suppose i should say he hastened back to the forest and now after spying about to make sure that the dwarfs are not near has approached the house with the tray of pies on his head the pieman close behind the door now anybody want to buy any sort of baker's pie pies 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 he knocks at the door snow white does not answer the pieman goes to the window and looks in hello didn't you hear me knock i'm sorry but i can't let you in oh cooking i see just ready to mix eh that's my line of business baker pies all kinds pumpkin custard veal and ham chocolate lemon squash and lamb gooseberry blueberry peach and quince chicken coconut apple mince i really don't want any thank you of course not no good cook would ever eat a baker's pie and you are a good cook well i've had some experience i can tell that by the hitch of your apron now my specialty is apple pies and oh please don't offer to give me one i couldn't take it who was offering i just wanted to ask your opinion i beg your pardon of course i'll give you my opinion you know that old apple tree half a mile back do those apples make good pies i don't know they look splendid here's one i picked it's as red and white as your face if it is a good pie apple i'll go back and get a sackful you can't tell from the looks you know some are too sweet and some are too sour well taste and we'll compare opinions you eat the red half and i'll eat the white he splits the apple in two and tosses the red half through the window into snow white's apron catch mm, just right to me sweet and sour snow white starts to taste her half but then with a faint suspicion she sets it down and says thank you but i don't eat between meals what temper touchy well i don't blame you often feel like that myself on baking days but this tastes to me like a prime pie apple i advise you to get some look to your baking good day anybody want to buy any sort of baker's pie pies 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 he makes off into the forest i was horrid to him he only wanted my advice he didn't try to come in it is the splendid apple she looks at it longingly if it's good i could make the dwarfs an apple dumpling apiece he ate his half she bites the red cheek of the apple suddenly she grasps her throat whirls about once falls and lies quite still after a moment the face of the pieman appears at the window peering in cautiously ah she did taste it i thought she would if i went away but there must be no mistake this time no more mistakes he leans through the window and with his staff pries up the bar that fastens the door first off with this disguise old days nine pot in the porridge peas cold porridge peas hot porridge peas and instantly the pieman's outward appearance changes and it is queen brangamar in her royal robes that sweeps into the room and hastens to snow white's body kneeling beside snow white no breath no heart quite dead at last this time my lady white as snow red as blood and black as ebony the dwarfs cannot wake you but i must hide that she picks up the apple they mustn't trace me then rising 
she strides to the door and cries now you wretched little dwarfs you miserable little gnomes you moles you earthworms bring her to life this time if you can i defy you queen brangamar defies you she rushes off into the wood crying as she goes dead at last at last at last hardly has the queen's voice died away when the stone over the underground passage is lifted and blick appears did you call snow white i was standing guard and i thought i heard he sees Snow White's prostrate body. He goes to her and touches her hand. It is cold. With a voice of agony, he cries down the passage. Brothers! Brothers! The curtain falls. After a moment, it rises again. It is moonlight now, and the dwarfs, with lighted lanterns, are grouped about the bed on which they have laid Snow White. All day long they have tried to restore her. They have bathed her face with water and wine, and fanned her, and chafed her little hands and feet, but without avail. After a long silence, Blick speaks. There is no hope, my brothers. There is nothing more to do. Our Snow White is dead. One by one, they kneel about her silently, but little Quee unable to restrain his tears, falls sobbing at her feet. Again, the curtain falls. End of Scene 5
Scene 7 of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs by Jesse Bram White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 7 The Throne Room of the Palace. Sir Dandy Pratt is standing in the middle of the room, surrounded by all the maids of honor. He looks puzzled and distressed. To Sir Dandy Pratt. Of course it's today that Snow White is coming home. It's a year and a day to day. We thought, of course, you knew. Dear me, are you sure? It's most important. She went away to school on the 20th of June. Last year. And today is the 21st. This year. So it must be a year and a day today. Pooh. That's not the way to reckon it. It ought to be done with arithmetic. Let me see. He shuts his eyes and repeats. Thirty days has September, April, June, and... That's no use. Oh, I know. I know now. How many days are there in a year? Hiding a smile. Three hundred and sixty-five, usually. I've got it now. Quiet, quiet. I take June twentieth. He writes on his tablet with his big gold pencil. And add three hundred and sixty-five. Sure to arrive on June the 385th. Hmm, that can't be right. It's most puzzling. Prince Florimond comes today, too. What? Prince Florimond, too? Of course, to be engaged to Snow White. The prince coming and nothing arranged? Nothing! No one ever tells me anything in this court. He may be here any moment, and all the armies are hunting for Bothold. And the dukes and duchess scattered all over the place playing croquet. I shall go distracted. I shall go distracted. He hurries out onto the terrace and first turns to the right, then to the left, then to the right again, before he can finally make up his foolish old mind to go to the left and waddles out of sight. I hope Snow White will come before the prince does. I shall hug her to death. I didn't really believe a year and a day would ever be over. Just think how much she'll know. I hope she'll know more than the Queen. And asks questions the Queen can't answer. Wouldn't that be fun? Oh, let's play that Snow White is coming home. I'll be Snow White. You always want to be Snow White. Ignoring the interruption to Astelaine. You be the Queen. To Rosalys. You be the Prince. I'll be Sir Dandy Pratt. Well then, announce the prince. And she and Rosalys run out onto the terrace, ready to re-enter as Snow White and the prince, respectively. Wait till I get on the throne. She arranges an imaginary train, then sweeps to the throne and gazes into an imaginary mirror. I think I'm looking particularly handsome today. Any visitors, Sir Dandiprat? As Sir Dandiprat announcing. His royalty, Prince Florimond, your majesty. Rosalys enters as the prince bowing low in the doorway. Has Princess Snow White come home yet, your majesty? I love her to distractedness. I should like to marry her at once, please. Peeping in from the terrace. Now me. No, wait, let me talk a little. Dear me, Prince Florimond, I mean, dear us. We don't understand what you can possibly see in that plain child. But Christabel will wait no longer, and appears in the doorway pushing her back. Wait till I announce you. Resuming Sir Dandy Pratt's voice. Here's the princess now. Most important. The princess Snow White. Christabel re-enters, makes a curtsy, as much like Snow White's as she can. Then going to Prince Rosalys, she says, You ought to speak first. As the prince, kneeling, Snow White, I love you very much. May I kiss your hand? I should be very much obliged. Now I should like to ask the Queen something. Can your Majesty spell hippopotamus? You mustn't be able to. I wasn't going to. Then, as the Queen again, and in a loud whisper, However do you spell it, Sir Dandiprat? I can't think, your Majesty. You never do. Strutting about with puffed-out cheeks. Really, I shall go distracted. I shall go dis... 
but she has to clap her hand quickly over her mouth, for the real Sir Dandy Pratt's voice is heard on the terrace, exclaiming, I shall go distracted. And in he bustles, followed by all the dukes and duchesses, whom he hastily arranges in their proper places about the room. The prince is here, the prince is here. We're keeping his highness waiting. Quickly, quickly, my dear dukes and duchesses, quickly, quickly. A trumpet sounds, and Prince Florimond enters, followed by his pages. The courtiers bow low. I'm sorry to have kept your highness waiting. I'll inform the queen at once that you've arrived. She's been expecting you all the morning. Just a moment, your highness. As he makes for the door, he whispers to Christabel. Where is the queen? Try in front of all the looking glasses. Most disrespectful. You will drive me distracted. Distracted! He paddles off to find the queen. To Rosalys. Lady Rosalys, has the princess returned? Not yet, your highness, but we expect her every moment. Is she well? I don't know, your highness. She hasn't written to us since she went away. Not a single letter. Sir Dandy Pratt reappears and announces, Her Majesty, the Queen. Queen Brangamar enters, and with a haughty nod to Prince Florimond, sweeps to the throne. I totally forgot you were coming today, Florimond. Stupid of me. Poor boy, I've sad news for you. I ought to have written, but I hated to distress you. It's about Snow White. Snow White? I deeply regret to say she is dead. Dead? It happened at boarding school, a few days after she arrived. Snow White? Dead? I sent at least eighteen doctors, but it was useless. The prince sinks sobbing on the steps of the throne. Pray don't distress yourself. Everything possible has been done. I built a splendid monument over her grave, a tall gilded shaft surrounded by four groups of... Suddenly she sees the stern figure of Bertold. He has been standing silent and unnoticed in the doorway. She cries out. Berthold! Advancing. Yes, Berthold. Berthold, come to punish you. Seize him! Arrest him! Dandiprat, the soldiers! I'm awfully sorry, Your Majesty, but the soldiers are all out hunting for him. I fear neither your soldiers nor your witchcraft now. No army, no court, no kingdom will be yours when I have told my tale. Don't listen to him! He's mad! I imprisoned him because he was mad! No, for fear that I would reveal your wickedness. But I escaped. I tunneled under the tower and fled back to the forest to search for Snow White. Last night, in a secret dell, I found... Rising with a cry. You found her? Yes, but she lay in a coffin, all made of shining crystal, as fair as if she were asleep, and guarding her day and night were seven dwarfs. But she is dead. Yes, and you did the deed. Nonsense. The man is quite mad. Snow White died at boarding school. I made the arrangements myself. With that falsehood on your lips, look! The seven dwarfs appear on the terrace bearing Snow White's coffin, covered with its pall of flowers. They march slowly into the room, cowering on her throne in an agony of fear. The dwarfs! Merciful stars, what are they bringing? No, no, take it away, take it away! You shall not bring her here, you shall not! Rushing from the throne, the queen hurls herself upon the dwarfs to prevent their setting down the coffin. So sudden is her onslaught that they cannot resist her, and with a crash of crystal it is overturned. With a cry of horror, the dwarfs surround it, and the courtiers crowd about them. For a moment the queen is alone. She seizes the magic mirror that hangs at her girdle, and with trembling lips whispers, Mirror, mirror, in my hand, who's the fairest in the land? What the mirror answers will never be known, for hardly has it begun to speak when, with a cry of rage, the queen dashes it into a thousand pieces on the floor. Suddenly she clasps her hands over her face, sinks to her knees with a moan, and draws her veil close. And now there is a gasp of wonder from the courtiers, and Rosalind's voice cries, Oh, look! Snow White! The group parts, and Snow White, half supported by the dwarfs, is seen to stir, rushing to her. 
Snow White, my beloved, she lives! He kneels beside her and raises her head. <sighs> oh, it was such a long, sad dream. I dreamed that I was dead. It was all dark and still. I could not move or see. Then just now came a great noise. Was it an earthquake? And this loosened in my throat. Why, see, it's a little piece of apple. Then there was a warm rushing hair. She lays her hand on her breast. And I woke up. Or am I dreaming now? No, there are my dwarfs, and Rosalys, and Crisabel, and— Where am I? With a cry of fear she struggles to her feet. Ah! This is the palace! The queen will find me! Hide me, brothers, I'm afraid! Pouncing upon the cowering queen. She shall never harm you again, my princess. What shall her punishment be? Let us starve her in the grey tower, as she would have starved my children. If I might suggest, your highness. But the queen, writhing from Berthold's grasp, creeps to Snow White's feet and makes an imploring gesture. Hush, please. I think she wants to speak to me. Yes, to you alone. She wants to speak to me alone. Please let her. Be careful, princess. I am not afraid any more. Leave us for a moment. The others withdraw a little, leaving Snow White and the Queen together. Oh, Snow White, my punishment has come. I broke the mirror, and my beauty is gone for ever. The mirror? Oh, forgive me. I shall never be jealous of you again, only let me go away where no one can ever see my face. You shall be queen now. Here is the crown. She thrusts it into Snow White's hand. I to be queen? I don't understand. You don't believe me? Then look, but, oh, let no one else see. She lifts her veil a little so that Snow White alone can see her face. Oh, how dreadful! Poor Brangomar! I forgive you, I pity you from the bottom of my heart. She turns to the others. Please, let the Queen go away unharmed. She wants to go far, far away. Barring the way. Unpunished? Never, Your Highness. Never, never, never. 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 I beseech you, she will never harm anyone again. I answer for her. I have forgiven her. Let her go. Reluctantly, the courtiers part and make a way for the queen. She kisses the hem of Snow White's dress, and then, her veil drawn close, makes her way toward the door. But just as she reaches the terrace, who should appear there but Witch Hex? She looks very differently now. Instead of her red cloak and pointed hat, she wears a neat black silk dress with a white fichu around her shoulders and a black bonnet with lavender-coloured flowers. On her arm she carries a basket, in which is an ordinary-sized black cat. The witch, stopping the queen, Heidi tidy what's all this? The queen, clinging to her, Oh, witch hex! 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 Don't be frightened, I'm not witch hex anymore. I gave up magic for good, and all day before yesterday burned all my charms, shrunk fiddle down to his natural size. She shows the cat. And retired. Perfectly respectable old lady now. But whatever have you been doing, Brangamar? Oh, Hex, I broke the magic mirror. And turned ugly. I told you you would some day. Well, serves you right. Let's see. She tries to lift the queen's veil, preventing her. Oh, no, no, no! Oh, yes, yes, yes! You were fond enough of showing your face before. Turnabout is fair play. She snatches off the veil. The queen has surely turned ugly, but it is a funny kind of ugliness. None of her features have changed except her nose, but that has grown enormous almost a foot long and very red. Ha ha ha! Oh my stars and garters! What a nose! What a nose! Please don't laugh at her. Oh, Hex, can't you help me? Afraid not. The only way to be beautiful without magic is to be good. Who are all these fine folks? Strutting forward importantly. Allow me to present. Shoo shoo, old turkey cock. Meantime, the queen creeps quietly away on the terrace, 
and is never seen or heard of again. Going to Snow White. You must be Snow White. How did you come alive? I made a poison apple for you. Glad it didn't work, but why didn't it? I think the big greedy bite I took must have stuck in my throat. And just now something happened, and it got juggled out. Glad of it. Always was sorry for you. Who's this nice boy? Oh, Prince Florimond, of course. I can guess why you're here. Well, is the betrothal all arranged? Snow White hangs her head, and the prince blushes furiously. Embarrassed, eh? Well, I don't know of any better use for bold old people than to help shy young people. Where's the ring, young man? Oh, come, I'll rager you've been carrying it about for a year. Shyly, Prince Florimond produces the ring. Your hand, Snow White? Please, do you think I ought to, yet? You see, I didn't get to school to be prepared, and— You're just a dear, sweet little girl, and that's good enough for any man, prince or pauper. Put it on, Florimond. The prince does so. Now, young man, lead her to the throne and crown her properly, and we'll all swear allegiance to our new little queen. With stately grace, the young prince leads Snow White to the throne, and reverently sets the great crown on her little head. Then he kneels before her, and all the courtiers follow his example. Then there is a great burst of music, and all the trumpets in the palace blare. Rising and unsheathing his sword, the prince cries, Love and homage to our little queen. Love and homage to our little queen. queen. Furtively brushing away a happy tear. Oh, oh, please, please. During all this, the dwarfs have withdrawn shyly to the furthest corner of the room. But now Blick, clearing his throat and summoning all his courage, cries, Brothers, march! In military order, the dwarfs file to the throne. Some of them think they ought to kneel, and some of them think not. So they wobble for a bit, and then stand still. Your, er, er, your... Oh, Snow White, please tell us what to call you. You see, we've never met a queen before. Oh, my brothers, call me just Snow White. Always and always. Snow White, may we go now? Go? Where? To fetch you our wedding present, all our gold and jewels. We'll make you the richest queen in the whole world. And then back to our lonely house. And those suppers. And those beds. No, no. You must stay with me always. Always, my brothers. Hanging his head. But we are dwarfs. There are no nobler men in my kingdom. You shall be my bodyguard, and Bethold shall be your captain. What do you say, brothers? I say, hip, hip, hurrah! Hip, 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 hip hurrah! Dear me, I quite enjoy being respectable. And I can't see any reason why you shouldn't live happily ever after. Oh, princess, if I don't dance, I shall just die. And so shall I. So shall, so shall I. I. So shall I. So shall I. So shall I. To the prince. May queens dance, too, when they are very, very happy. Do you remember the first words I ever said to you? Lady, may I dance with you in the measure to ensue? And I answered, Sir, could any maid withstand such a flattering command? She gives him her hand, and they all whirl off into the gayest and happiest dance you can imagine. Even the dwarfs, who, you remember, never could learn. Hopping solemnly for joy, as the curtain falls. P.S. Snow White and Prince Florimond did live happily ever after, as the witch had predicted. End of Scene 7 End of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs by Jessie Bram White